What a privilege to be here again. This is an amazing place. Uh, I want to tell you briefly uh, about three things. One, a brother in Asia. Two, a church in Brazil. And three, briefly, how our family fits in. So one, a brother in Asia. So just a few months ago, I met uh, Brother Timothy. Uh, Brother Timothy grew up in a very Buddhist context. Uh, stringently Buddhist, uh, was sent by his father to another country to go to a Buddhist monastery to become a monk. And long story short, he meets a shopkeeper in the area and through the witness of this shopkeeper becomes a Christian. So brother Timothy goes back home and tells his family, I've become a Christian. And their response the response from the father was to beat him and then send him out of the home. So in this context, uh, to change your faith is not just one small piece of who you are. It's one piece of everything. So to say you're no longer Buddhist means you're no longer part of the family. You're no longer a part of that bigger clan. You're no longer a part of that country because the country is officially Buddhist. So to turn your back on Buddhism is to turn your back on everything. So he left everything to become a Christian and stood firm in his faith. And the question for Timothy was kind of like, now what? Okay, so I become a Christian, but what's next? And for Timothy, as well as many others in Asia and other places around the world, the teaching they get comes from television. So people like Benny Hinn are all over the television. And if you don't know Benny Hinn, he is a prosperity preacher. So he preaches things like, uh, if you will give to our ministry and you have a lot of faith, God will heal you from your diseases. He will give you the money that you need to survive and to sustain yourself. Uh, and this kind of teaching destroys people's faith, it damages the church, and that's basically the only teaching they get. So for Timothy, he's wondering, now what? How do I grow in my faith? How do I share my faith with other people? Uh, the people who proclaimed the gospel to me gave me a Bible, but I have a hard time understanding it. I don't know what all these things mean. So what does Timothy do? That's where Training Leaders International tries to help. So we go to places like Asia, uh, to people like Timothy, who don't have access to any kind of seminary training, whether it be in his country or going abroad, it's just not available for so many people. So when we go to a guy like Timothy and the group that's around him, we go at least nine times to this same location. And we teach them nine separate courses with the goal that by the end, they'll be able to teach and they'll be able to preach faithfully from the Bible. So now that uh, Timothy has received training, he's going to be going out from the capital city of his country to uh, a central area where he's going to be partnering with another man who has started a very small house church and he's going to be doing teaching and preaching and reaching out to surrounding peoples where there's absolutely no gospel presence whatsoever. So he's going to places where you and where I could never go. They would never let an American there and even if somebody snuck in, the villagers would never accept you. But because he's local, he can go. So we're giving him the training he needs to do the work that God is calling him to do. So that's our brother Timothy. Uh, church in Brazil, so in a more developed place like Brazil, where they do have some seminaries, uh, they struggle yet with a lot of liberal theology. So the many seminaries that were started in Brazil were started from very liberal perspectives. And it's difficult for people from a conservative background to get, again, the training that they need. Well, there's a, a large 1,000-member church, strong church, uh, outside of Sao Paulo that has started their own church-based seminary. Well, even a solid church doesn't know a lot about starting a school. So how do we do that? What, uh, where do we even begin? 
and TLI comes alongside churches to help them plant their own schools. Places where guys can get both academic training and supervised ministry experience together. So they're not just being loaded up with a bunch of knowledge and then sent out with no idea how to actually do something in ministry. They're getting both experience and academic training and we're helping them. Uh, they, how do you put together a scope and sequence for curriculum? Uh, do you need a board or is the elder board at your church enough? Uh, do you know what your ideal graduate looks like? What do you want someone to be able to do? What do you want them to know? What kind of character do you want your graduates to have? These are questions that are just not intuitively obvious. So we come alongside churches to help them. So now the First Baptist Church of Achibaya has already graduated their first group of students. Uh, two of those students are now coming back to the church to do some of the teaching themselves. So guys with really strong aptitude, guys that I would think were asking questions I would expect from uh, a PhD student. These guys are sharp and they're coming back to now do some of the training themselves. And the church is sending missionaries to places like Venezuela. How many Americans are going to go to Caracas? Uh, they're sending missionaries to Cuba. Not very many Americans are going to be going to Cuba, Angola, in southwestern Africa. So Brazilians, again, can go to places where Americans either can't or won't go. So we're coming alongside a strong church to help them develop the next generation of leaders and missionaries to go out to do the work that God has called them to do. So our family gets to play a small role in this amazing work that God is doing all over the world. And God is at work all over the world. Uh, and so my family and I are training pastors. And we do that by living in Minnesota, of all places. <laughs> Which is not nearly as nice as here. <laughs> Um, so Sarah and I moved from Oahu where we were living uh, and felt so strongly called to help these guys that don't have any training that we moved to Minnesota so that I could receive a master's degree and then I went on for a PhD and while we were there we got connected with Training Leaders International and Training Leaders International is based in Minneapolis which is why we still live there um, we wish that we could start TLI Pacific, um, <laughs> but that hasn't been in the cards for us yet. So we live in Minneapolis and I travel four or five times uh, internationally each year to do these trainings and to come alongside the seminaries. And in between time, I'm putting together classes, putting together the teams, helping the other guys that come along on the team to be ready to teach. Um, I'm also communicating regularly with our schools to help them uh, think through all the issues that are involved with doing the work God has called them to do. It's never our vision. We want to come alongside and help people do what God wants them to do. So that's primarily what makes up our role with TLI. I do teaching, I coach guys to get ready to go teach with us, and then I'm helping the schools that are already on, or helping people and helping churches plant schools and then get them running and then running better and better and better. So that's what we do with TLI and we are so grateful that Molokai Baptist Church is with us. We thank you so much for your prayers. We can't do this without you. Uh, it's hard for Sarah and the kids when I'm gone. Uh, things like, you know, the baby falls off the bed, gets a bonk on her head, Sarah needs to take her in. What does she do with the other kids? They're on spring break. Where's dad? Right, so this is it's hard. Uh, and Sarah and the kids have done really well with managing the household while I travel, typically two weeks at a time. So we appreciate so much your prayers. We appreciate your support. We're so grateful that you are with us. And Jim uh, is going to be around after service. You can ask him any question that you want. He's a doctor, so he knows. Um, but um, what I didn't say is that Sarah is uh, Lenny and Adele Lieb's daughter. If you know Lenny and Adele, and if you don't, you are missing out. Um, but um, great to have you guys back and looking forward to hearing more about how God is using you.
Hey, you know, as I was thinking about uh, uh, this Haiti trip coming up and and then the, Jim and Sarah are going to be here today uh, Just very interesting that there's there's kind of this emphasis without even purposely doing it on missions and being sent And I just want to share with you a, a brief uh, scripture this morning Because I think sometimes what happens is we see somebody like Jim and Sarah and we go wow That's really cool wish I could have done something like that or uh, you know I'm Glad I don't do something like that, you know I mean, we have mixed uh, feelings on missionaries, right? And what they're called to do. And, and you know, these guys, they, they don't get a regular salary. That's why, you know, churches like ours help support them because that's, that's how they go is they live by faith, literally. And so sometimes we think, well, how does that all work? And how does someone get sent? And, you know, the reality is we're all sent. It just depends on where we're sent, right? And, and I want to show you this scripture. It's in Luke chapter 9. If you have your Bible this morning, just a couple of verses I want to read to you. For some of you, this may be a familiar passage. For some, maybe you've never really parked on it before. But I was looking at this several years ago, and I thought, man, there, there is so many good things in here. Luke chapter 9, we're well into Jesus' ministry. He's been training some leaders. Jesus was training 12 guys because pretty soon he was going to take off. He was going to leave. And he was going to need to pass the ministry on to capable leaders. And so he's training these 12 guys. And what we see in chapter 9, the first few verses, is he gives them a little taste of ministry. And this is what we read. One day, Jesus called together his 12 disciples and he gave them power and authority to cast out all demons and to heal all diseases. Then he sent them out to tell everyone about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Do you see that? Do you see verse 2? Then he sent them out. And he said this to them in verse 3, Take nothing for your journey. Don't take a walking stick, a traveler's bag, food, money, or even a change of clothes. Wherever you go, stay in the same house until you leave town. And if a town refuses to welcome you, shake its dust from your feet as you leave to show that you have abandoned those people to their fate. Now, this is a story about Jesus sending out these leaders, these disciples, these guys that he'd been training. They're not quite ready yet, but he's going to give them a taste of ministry. And, and I really believe that some of the things that we can see here is how God sends and what he does when he sends people. And so very quickly, let me give you three things. Here's the first one. He sends with power and authority. Look what it says there in verse 1. He calls together his 12 and he gave them power and authority. It's one thing to have power. It's another thing to have authority. The, the word for power here in the original means the ability to do something. The word authority means the right to do something. Power is the ability to do something. Authority is the right to do something. There's a difference. If you put a taser in my hand, it's a dangerous thing, right? I now have power. I can take this taser and I can shoot you with it and you're going to drop right there. Now, I also get into a lot of trouble because I have no authority. I just have the power. Now, if I become a legitimate police officer, right, I am given a taser. I have power to make sure that the law is abided by. And now, because I'm a police officer, I have authority to make sure that that happens as well. So if you're breaking the law and I shoot you with the taser, I have used my power and my authority. I've used my ability, right? And I have demonstrated my right as a police officer in doing that. So when Jesus sends these guys out, he sends them with power, the ability, and also the authority, right? 
And, and I want you to understand something. Implied in that is that they didn't have power and authority. Jesus didn't come to these guys and say, guys, I've been watching you and you are just so powerful. You're just so amazing. And you know what I want to do? I want to send you out to do this little job that I have. No, the implication is that they didn't have power and authority because you don't have to give somebody something that they already have, right? And so Jesus is giving them something that they don't already have so that they can do the job that they need to do. So many times we wait. Okay, God, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to go talk to this person. I'm going to go, I'm going to get involved in this thing as, as soon as I get everything that I need, as soon as I work myself up for it. And the reality is, many times what God is saying is, no, I want to send you to do this, and I'm going to give you the power. I'm going to give you the authority. And that's exactly what was going on here. And so many times we look at it and say, well, I'm just not, I, I'm not capable. I can't do it. And that's the whole point. The disciples weren't either. They weren't equipped for this. He had to give them the power and the authority. And here's the deal. When you know that God sent you, when he's called you to do something, he's sending you, giving you that power and authority, and you know it comes from him, that's very humbling. Because then you realize it's not about me. It's not what I'm doing. It's what he's doing through me. And you talk to a lot of people. I've been amazed over the years talking to different people in ministry and finding out how many of them are really shy people. And yet they do some bold, uh, uh, upfront things. And, they, and they'll tell you, you know, I'm, I'm not, this is not really me. It's not my personality. I don't like being in front of people or I don't like just, you know, going up and talking to people. And my dad is one of them. When you, when you talk to him and you listen to his stories, he has the gift of evangelism, like very few people I know. He can talk to anybody, and within just a very few minutes, he gets into conversations about the Lord. And it's very natural. It's not, you know, it's not awkward. It's not stiff. I've been with him. And every time I've seen him do it over and over again, and I've never ceased to be in awe watching him just flow naturally into a conversation about the Lord. And many times before it's all said and done, that person will be bowing their head and trusting Christ right there. And I, I've seen it when, the time I was a little boy going with him on uh, visitation when he was pastoring and, and just watching some of these things take place. And then as an adult watching it and seeing it going, man, how does he do that? But if he were here this morning, he'd tell you, that's not, I'm not naturally like that. I'm not real comfortable with strangers. And yet, if you saw him in action, you would say, man, this guy is just real charismatic and, you know, people don't bother him. What is it? It's God giving him the ability and the authority to do that. See, look, if we just wait around, if we just, man, I'm not, I can't do this, I'm not equipped, well, you're right, you're not. None of us are. And that's the whole point. And when Jesus sends these guys out, he sends them with power and authority. And I'm sure if Jim continued to tell us stories this morning, he would share more of those types of ideas about situations he's been in and seen where he knows that it's God's power working in him, not his own abilities, not his own strength. Well... The second thing I wanted to point out to you as we look at this is that he sends with purpose, not just with power and authority, but with purpose. Look at verse 2. He sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healings. Whatever mission that Jesus sends a person out on, the purpose is always for the kingdom. See, again, if we're not careful, we look at situations like a missionary that comes in and shares with us or, you know, some speaker that speaks uh, uh, maybe revival situations where they're speaking to thousands of people. Ah, I can't do that. And, man, that's great that they can do that. And, 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 and it's great that the kingdom is being expanded by this. But here's the reality. When God saved you, when you placed your faith in Jesus, he saved you to send you. And it may just be across the street. And what he sends us to do is proclaim the kingdom. And that's not always with our mouth. Proclaiming the kingdom is the way that we live our lives. You and I that are married, we proclaim the kingdom by the way we do marriage. 
Because kingdom marriages look different than other marriages. Marriages that are based and founded on this book look different than the world's marriages. They're kingdom marriages. You know, um, I shared with, um, with, with Ed and Bea as they were coming for counseling. We talked about when two people come together, God's uh, plan for them is to become one. The two become one. Well, the world says, no, 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 you keep your independence. The two need to stay two. You need to be your own person. Don't let him tell you what to do. Don't let her tell you what to do. You might get married and have a home, but don't ever think that you're ever going to become one because then you're going to lose your identity. You're going to lose who you are. See, but God's word says when two people come together, their goal is to be a reflection of God's kingdom in the way that they do marriage. The way that you do family. If you're a kingdom person, should be different than the rest of the world. The way you do family should proclaim the kingdom to everybody else. The way that you deal with your kids and the way that your kids reflect Jesus. Right? We shouldn't do it like everybody else. Too many times we look at the world for our cues on how to do things. And we're supposed to be kingdom people living kingdom lives so that we reflect the kingdom. We proclaim the kingdom by the way that we do marriage, by the way that we do family, by the way that we do employment. How do you work? Are you proclaiming the kingdom as you work? See, sometimes we don't think about this. We think about the job that we do as a necessity because I've got to pay the bills and I've got to get through life. But did you realize that if you are a child of God, the work that you have is what he sent you to do. You've been sent into that situation. Lay just started a new job a couple of weeks ago, and we talked about this. A couple of weeks ago, she came in. We prayed before she went to her interview, and we prayed specifically, God, if this is where you're sending her, then may she know it. And obviously it is, because she got the job, and she sees it as a job that God has sent her into, not just to pay the bills, but to be a kingdom person Proclaiming the kingdom, not necessarily always with her mouth, but by the way she does her job. We need to do it with excellence so people go, why, why do you do, you know, we could get away with this and you could take an extra uh, five minutes on this break, but you don't. Why, why do you do things the way you do? And that gives us an opportunity to proclaim the kingdom, right? So... Jesus sends these guys out with purpose to proclaim the kingdom. You and I have been sent out with purpose to proclaim the kingdom by the way that we live our lives. And then it says uh, he sends them out to heal. To heal is to cure, to restore to health. Man, again, I don't, when we were singing that song this morning and it talked about uh, Jesus coming uh, with clouds of fire, I just, I just got this picture in my mind that that's, when he comes back the second time, it's not his savior, it's his judge. And man, that just overwhelmed me because I started thinking, man, there's so many people that need to know right here on our island, right? And so when these guys were going, Jesus was sending them with healing. And we think about the physical healing and all that's good and well, but that's temporal. You and I have been sent with the message of spiritual healing. That people can be healed from the sickness of their sin. They can have their sin forgiven. They don't have to worry about that judgment that will one day come. See, because God is not only a good God, he's a just God. He has to punish sin because he's perfect and holy. And he's made a provision for that through Jesus. That's what the death of Christ was all about. But you have to accept that payment. When someone makes a payment for you, you can either accept it or reject it. No, thank you. I won't take it. I think I'll figure this out on my own. And you can do that because it's your choice. But the, the problem is there is no other way. There is no salvation, Scripture tells us, in anyone else except through Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's an exclusive statement. And God has sent us 
with the purpose of proclaiming the kingdom. We do that verbally, but even just as importantly, we do that by the way that we live our lives. Amen? Yes. And then the last one is this in verse 3. He sends us with provision. It says that Jesus said to them, Take nothing for your journey, neither a staff, nor a bag, nor bread, nor money, and don't even uh, have two tunics apiece. Now, it, that, that doesn't mean a whole lot to us because it's in the context of their culture. But this was a big deal. Jesus said, don't take anything. I'm sending you out. I'm going to send you with power and authority. I'm going to send you with purpose. And I don't want you to take anything with you. And then he's specific and he tells them what not to take. Don't take a staff. You go, what's a staff? A staff was just basically a big stick. And they carried a staff for protection. When you're traveling in those days, you needed protection from wild animals. The staff would be like a gun would be for us today or, or a bow and arrow. But that, that staff, as an animal came to attack you, you could whack that animal with it. If you were going to be robbed, many times on those roads there were thieves and the staff was used to protect them. He said, don't take that. What? Don't take any protection? Then he goes on, he says, don't take a bag. He said, well, what's a bag? Think of a backpack the stuff that you would need. Uh, it was a leather pouch and it would hold provisions. It would hold your extra food. It would hold stuff that you would need on your journey. Jesus said, don't take that. Don't take any protection with you. Don't take anything where you can be uh, loaded down with extra stuff. He said, don't even take bread. What is that? Food. Don't take any food. Don't take any snacks. Don't take any provisions. Now, if you're ever traveling with my wife, she is the snack goddess, man. She's, she has got anything and everything that you need to snack on. I mean, she'll pull stuff out and it's like, where did you get a full roasted chicken? I mean, that... <laughs> Jesus tells these guys, don't take any of that stuff. No, don't take any snacks. Don't take any food. Then he says, don't take any money. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't have protection. I don't have a bag to carry my stuff. I don't have any food. At least I can take some money so I can buy some of the stuff I need. Jesus said, don't take any money with you. Now, it gets even better because watch this. In my translation, it says um, to not take a change of clothes. That's not quite what it says here. <coughs> The, the word there that's translated clothes in the New Living Translation is the word tunic. A tunic was the garment you wore underneath your clothes closest to your body. Think underwear. Jesus said, I don't even want you to take a change of underwear with you. All right, Jesus, now you're getting personal. I get the staff, the bag, the bread, the money, but now you're telling me I'm not even supposed to take underwear with me. Except the pair that you got on, probably. And I guess, you know, you can turn it inside out or whatever. But he's telling them here, don't take all this stuff. You say, what is this all about? Why is he sending them out? He gives them power and authority. That's great. He gives them purpose. That's really good. Now he's telling them, don't take any of this other stuff. Why? Because the goal is, I want you to rely on me. If you take all of this equipment, all this stuff, what are you going to do? You're going to rely on all your stuff, all your equipment. Think David. Do you remember the story of David and Goliath? We went over this just a couple of weeks ago. And David's, David steps up to the plate and says, look, if nobody else goes, I'll fight that giant. And so Saul the king goes, oh, good. We finally have somebody. He's kind of young. Here, come here. Try on my armor. You need some armor to go out there and fight Goliath. And he tries on the armor, and it's way too big, and it's all clunky. And he goes, man, I can't wear this stuff. I've never practiced with it. And so he sheds all the armor, the stuff that would protect him against this big bad giant and he goes out there just in his shepherd's garb. And the point of that is very similar to the point of this. 
He wasn't going to rely on the armor. He wasn't going to rely on the things that traditionally would be relied on. He was relying on God and God alone. And when Jesus sends these guys out, he goes, look, I don't want you to rely on all your stuff. I don't want you to rely on your brilliance. I don't want you to rely on your own power because you don't have it. I don't want you to rely on your own authority because you don't have that either. I want you to totally rely on my provisions. And I don't want you to miss this, though, in verse 4. He says, wherever you go, stay in the same house until you leave town. Well, whose house would they be staying in? It wasn't theirs. It wasn't their house. It was somebody's house who came to them and said, Hey, are you, are you staying anywhere? Oh, no, we don't have any place to sit. Well, stay with us. Come, stay with us. Well, what's going on? God was saying, Jesus was saying to these guys, look, I'm going to provide even a place for you to stay. Don't worry about it. And when you get to that town and people say, hey, come stay with us, stay with them and stay right there because it's my provision. See, here's the deal. God uses others to provide what we need when he sends us. He could drop it out of the sky if he wanted to, but he doesn't normally do it that way. I mean, Jim, have you had that happen anytime recently where you just needed something? Boom, there just dropped out of the sky. He typically uses people, right? He uses churches and he uses people that say, wow, I sense that God wants me to give to this person that he sent. And that's what's happening here. Jesus is saying, look, when you go, you're going to go into these homes because people are going to say, hey, come stay with us. And God is going to provide. I am going to provide for you. Don't take the staff. Don't take the bag. Don't take the bread. Don't take the money. Don't even take underwear. I'm going to take care of you. And he provides in that kind of way. Hey, we've seen this just in the last few weeks. Clint and McKenzie feel very strongly that God was calling them to Molokai. We felt very strongly that God was calling them here to Molokai Baptist Church. They had nothing. Literally. And over the weeks, how has God provided for you guys? Abundantly. Over and over again. Right? It didn't drop out of the sky. Right? They didn't just pray and open their eyes. Oh, there it is. No, you know where it came from? Right here. People right here. They said, wow, we have an extra one of these. Hey, I've got some. Hey, could you use this? And what's God doing? God's saying, I'm going to send you. I've got a calling on your life. And don't worry, I'm going to provide for you as well. See? So... Where does this take us? Well, you say, oh, that's a great, great stuff for somebody like Jim and Sarah who God sends out on some crazy kind of mission deal. And that's great. And I hope that they have enough faith to believe all of that, that God will send them with power and authority and purpose and provision. And God bless you guys. But God's called every one of us in here to something. He sent every one of us in here. If you've placed your faith and trust in Christ, and when he sends us, he gives us the power and authority that we need. He gives us a purpose. It's always a kingdom purpose. And he will provide everything you need. He may tell you, I don't want you to take all this stuff. I don't want you to rely on this stuff. I want you to rely on me. See, we've got this deal next week. I believe God's called us to this. Do you believe that? I mean, why on earth we take that great big tent and all the stuff that we got to do, you know, and Danny's going, man, I need more bodies to help because this is a big deal. And it is a big deal. Why? I mean, we could just do it in here. We could just do our, you know, hour set up in here and tell everybody, hey, come to our, our church for Easter. We could just do it in here. Why are we doing it over there? And why are we risking, you know, the weather? And why are we asking people to cook and, and, and extra bodies to, to be ushers and greeters? Why are we doing all that? Because God's called us to it. God said, hey, I want you to do this. I want you to reach your island this way. And he's going to provide everything that we need. The power, the authority, the kingdom purpose. He's going to provide 
everything. If we just did these things, folks, because, oh, we got the money, let's do it, we wouldn't do most of the stuff that we do. God's calling us to Haiti, this, you know, this mini group. Well, we don't know how it's all going to come together, but we believe that God's paving the way. It made this kind of very specific even, the, the type of individuals needed, and so we're going. But what are some of the general things? Well, we talked about it, sharing the gospel with your neighbor. You know, God may lay that on your heart. I, I'm just not equipped that way. Well, let him give you the power and the authority. You got the kingdom purpose, and he'll give you the provision that you need. Amen? He might call you to be the kind of parent that you're supposed to be. Man, I don't, know, I don't know about you, but the first time I held my firstborn, who's a little bit bigger than that now, I remember just thinking to myself, this is crazy. I'm a dad. How do you do this? Right? But listen, if God has placed children in your hands, it's with a kingdom purpose. And he's going to give you the power and the authority that you need and provide everything you need as long as you're trusting him to raise those kids the way you need to. Marriage. Most of us don't realize when we say, I do. It's a big deal. It's really hard sometimes. I'm an easy guy to live with, but you know, sometimes... But here's the deal. We've got to come to a place where we say, wait a minute, wait a minute. If I really believe that God has directed me in this marriage, then he's going to give me the power and the authority and the kingdom purpose and all the provision I need to be the kind of husband that I need to be, be the kind of wife that I need to be. Any, any situation in our life, see? If we believe that God's sovereign, we have to believe that God's put us in that situation. He sends us. He puts us on, on that journey. People come to me periodically and say, man, how do, we, you know, I got to make this decision. I need to know where to go, you know. Um, uh, we've got several seniors in, in high school in here this morning. You know, Kale's one of them, getting ready to graduate in a couple months. And some, some of you have dealt with, you know, uh, what do I do about this job situation? I was talking to Ivan about this just a couple of weeks ago because of the close down of Microgen. And, you know, they're offering to take employees and move them to Kauai. And maybe should we, how do I know? What should I do? Well, the bottom line is this. Find out, seek what God wants. Because if he, if he calls you to a specific place, whether it's a college or a job or other type of situation, and you know, man, I really believe that God is calling me here. He's sending me here. Then guess what? Everything else will fall into place. Uh, everything else, the power, the authority, the purpose, the it'll fall into place. It doesn't mean it's going to fall into place the way you think. Right? In fact, Jim and Sarah can tell you, they thought they were on their way to China originally. They were ready. God, we're ready to go. We're, they were making preparation, and God totally changed direction. He wanted a willing heart, and they were willing to go wherever, and God said, good, I'm glad you're willing to go to China. I'm not sending you there. I'm doing this with you. Right? But see, here's the thing. As long as you're where God wants you to be, he is bound to give you power, authority, purpose, and provision. It doesn't mean you're going to know where all that's coming from from the start. In fact, you probably won't. It's a scary step. I'm here to tell you. I've been there. It's a scary step. I don't know. God, how are you going to provide? I don't have the ability to do this. God, how are we going to do this? And God says, just go. I'm sending you. Just go. Okay, I'm going to go, but I'm scared. And you step and you go. And then God starts providing all these different things. But see, what we want to do is we want to hold on and say, okay, God, I'll go, but let me take this, and I want to take this and this. And God says, no, leave the staff, leave the bag, leave the food, leave the money. Don't even take your underwear. I'm going to take care of you. It's hard stuff. But when God sends and God calls and God moves in your life, you got to believe that he's going to take care of every step of the way. Amen? Amen. Would you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes?